the nucleus. So our goals for this session are uh, just to talk generally about the nucleus and all what we call the mass defect. That pertains to nuclear binding energies, the energy associated with keeping the nucleus together. So what is a nucleus? Well, here's a new word for you, nucleon. So a nucleus consists of protons and neutrons. And collectively, protons and neutrons are known as nucleons, particles that are found in the nucleus. Uh, so we characterize every nucleus by two numbers. A, the atomic mass number, that's the total number of nucleons. And Z, which is the atomic number, and that's simply the number of protons. So the number of neutrons and the number of protons adds up to the atomic mass number. A is n plus z, n being the number of neutrons. So any nucleus can be written in the following form. Kind of uh, A as a superscript out front, z as a subscript out front, and then the chemical symbol for the nucleus itself. An example is this 2713 aluminum. So this is uh, somewhat redundant. So aluminum, by definition, uh, has 13 protons, and so has an atomic number of 13. Uh, but it can, then can have various isotopes, and the most common form of aluminum is aluminum-27. But that would be 14 neutrons. Uh, there are different forms of aluminum that have a different number of neutrons, but they all have the same number of protons. That's what makes it aluminum. How big do you think a nucleus is? So we know atoms are the size of a few angstroms, 10 to the minus 10 meters, but it turns out that almost all of that is empty space. So the nucleus is way, way smaller than that. Typically we call it uh, femtometers, and a femtometer is 10 to the minus 15 meters. So you can sort of think of the nucleus as a bunch of balls, the protons and the neutrons, packed together into a roughly spherical object, and the radius of that sphere you can say is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 15 meters times a to the one-third. A being, again, the number of protons plus neutrons that you have in there. Okay, it's a very, very tiny thing, and uh, again, most of the atom is just empty space. Okay, so maybe you've heard of the atomic mass unit, and instead of writing down, you know, a tiny number of kilograms, then uh, we often talk about masses in terms of this thing we call the atomic mass unit. And that is defined in terms of the mass of, what do you think, one of those things? Feel free to pause there and think about it. And it turns out that one atomic mass unit happens to be exactly a twelfth of the mass of a carbon-12 atom. Okay, so here's a table, and you can see that uh, what one atomic mass unit is in kilograms. You can convert that using Einstein's famous equation. You can convert mass to energy. So it's 931.5 mega electron volts per C squared. Um, that's the kind of equivalent energy unit expressed as a mass. Uh, neutrons are slightly more massive than the protons, and electrons are... Uh, something like 1,800 times uh, less massive than the proton and the neutron. Okay, so let's think about that. Let's think about the atomic mass unit being defined as a twelfth of the carbon-12 atom, but what makes up the carbon-12 atom? So it's, let's see, six neutrons, six protons, and six electrons. If you add those things up, what would you get? Look at the, particularly the mass in atomic mass unit, U column. Okay, so let's do that. We'll take the six neutrons, six protons, six electrons, add them up, and you get 12.098931U. So that's what they individually add up to. But it turns out that when you combine them into a carbon-12 atom, the atom has a mass of precisely 12.000000000U. And so there's kind of this missing little bit of mass uh, that we know as the mass defect. Well, where does that mass go? Okay, so it turns out that that missing mass is associated with the binding energy of the atom. So we've converted a little bit of mass into energy, and that's what keeps the, uh, the nucleus together. And almost all of that's in the nucleus. So you can uh, say that 
every uh, U has an equivalent energy of 931.5 mega electron volts. And so you multiply that conversion factor, 0.098931, by that 931.5 MeV per U, and you get 92.15 mega electron volts worth of binding energy in the carbon-12 atom. Way more than the just several EVs that the electrons are bound together in, bound to the atom in with. Okay, so uh, in a typical nucleus, the binding energy is measured in millions of electron volts, and that's way larger than the binding energy of electrons, as I just said. And nuclear processes, such as reactions or decays, involve changing is it changes in that nuclear binding energy, and that can free up uh, millions of electron volts. So that's why these nuclear reactions give you way more energy than chemical reactions. What do you think holds the nucleus together? Well, you, again, you might want to pause and see what you think there. Okay, so uh, you might want to vote for love, and it is something we haven't heard of, actually, but it's not love. It's known as the strong nuclear force. So if you think about that, you know, uh, protons are positive, and they repel each other, and yet still the nucleus stays together. So there's a force in there, and, you know, the gravity can't do it. Gravity's way weaker than the electric force. So there's a force in the nucleus that attracts nucleons to nucleons. This is the strong nuclear force. And that must be larger than the re electrostatic repulsion in order for the nucleus to stay together. Okay, now it's a very uh, sort of small uh, small scale force. It's, it's uh, attractive at small scales, but uh, at larger distances really is not very important. Okay, so, but you do have this kind of tug of war between the uh, electrostatic force, protons repelling, and then this attractive force associated with the strong nuclear force. So way down low in the periodic table you find that stable nuclei, uh, nuclei have roughly an equal number of protons and neutrons, but as you get further out the, the periodic table you need to add more neutrons than protons in order to be stable. Okay, and in fact, beyond a certain point, you don't have any stable nuclei at all. So basically, the bismuth nuclei, nucleus sorry, that has 83 protons and 126 neutrons is the largest known stable nucleus. And so, what happens when you're unstable? Well, you basically decay. And we have a nice little chart here taken from Brookhaven National Lab that kind of demonstrates that. So down low at the bottom left, the black ones are the stable ones, and uh, you can see those uh, are roughly following the z equals n line, but as you get further up, the stable ones um, kind of curve over and have more neutrons than protons. Uh, these little funny lines at z is 20, 28, 50, 82, 8, uh, those are known as uh, sort of islands of stability there, and those are kind of, those represent actually filled nuclear shells. So there's a shell structure in the nucleus, analogous to the shell structure for electrons. Now the color coding here is about the half-life of various things. So basically, the closer you get to this stable middle line here, the spine of this kind of amoeba thing. Um, the more stable that you are. Okay, so the ones really far away have very short half-lives, they decay very quickly, and then as you get closer and closer to this stability zone, uh, the nuclei tend to last longer, so the half-lives are larger. Okay, but that's a overview of the nucleus. The end.